Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to New Book, the New Books Network. I'm Claire Clark. I'm one of the hosts of the network, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Mike J., who is an author and curator and has got a new book called Psychonauts, Drugs and the Making of the Modern Mind, which is going to be published any day now by Yale University Press in the U.S. in April and in May in the U.K., um, Mike's most recent book was Mescaline, A Global History of the First Psychedelic, and that was also published by Yale University Press um, in the U- U.S. and U.K., and he has written in all sorts of other places, the New York Review of Books, Lapham's Quarterly, the Public Domain Review, the Welcome Collection, the Literary Review, the London Review of Books, and I, I could go on and on, but um, we want to have time to talk about the new one. So um, with that, welcome to the show, Mike. Oh, thanks, Claire. Real pleasure to be here. Um, I wonder if you could start us out by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the business of doing drug history. Yeah, sure. It's uh, it's a kind of picaresque story. It wasn't really planned, but I think the way it worked out was, um, well, I, I grew up in London. I went to uh, Cambridge University and I studied philosophy. And uh, after I got a philosophy degree, I decided that I was kind of done, not, not just done with academia, but kind of actually done with books and um, with my youthful certainty I decided that text was the language of the past and the language of the future was going to be visual so I kind of spent most of my 20s working in film and TV in various jobs as an editor and a researcher and uh, yeah by the end of that decade the sort of very beginnings of um, uh, you know digital culture, uh, CD-ROM and CDI, if anyone's old enough to remember any of those formats. Uh, So I then worked my way back to writing, which in fact I'd always liked doing. And um, the first uh, stuff I got paid to write really was a few screenplays and um, uh, bits of journalism, uh, mostly recycling research that I was doing from film and TV stuff, and bits of um, digital writing, non-linear writing, and so on. And um, I was also an early adopter of the internet. So uh, uh, back in the days of, um, you know, uh, bulletin boards and alt news groups, and the thing that really fascinated me in the early internet was uh, all the drugs discussion and conversation because in the real world and in the mainstream media you couldn't really talk about drugs or rather they were always framed as a problem as a social problem or a medical problem or a crime problem or what should we do about addiction or whatever you know and then suddenly online was this world with thousands of incredibly knowledgeable people talking about drug experiences and talking about their history and their sort of culture and um i started to write a little bit about that and do bits of journalism about it and um at that time i happened to meet um the person who became my academic mentor, who was uh, called Michael Neve, and he was a senior lecturer at the uh, Wellcome Institute for the History of Medicine, as it was in those days, as a teaching unit um, uh, taught out of uh, UCL, University College London. Uh, and um, Michael worked alongside Roy Porter, who was the best known member of that group. Uh, But they'd been doing amazing work on medical history. Um, They were all kind of post-war, you know, historians from below. And that was the approach that they brought to medical history, which previously had been, um, you know, an awful lot of kind of retired um, physicians and practitioners talking about the triumphant medical advances during their careers. And um, Roy and Michael and, uh, you know, that circle at the welcome uh, got much more interested in patient testimony in the doctor patient relationship and the way that not that uh, the medical profession saw itself, but the way in which it was seen by the wider culture. And, um, so I've then had access to all the wondrous resources of the Welcome Library, and I started digging around into um, the history of 
drugs and particularly this kind of history from below, the history of the drug experience, drug users. At that point, academic drug history was quite a small, narrowly constituted world. And it was mostly about, you know, the you know the development of theories of addiction and um you know drug control and uh you know it was very much you know from the um from the from the expert non user perspective so i started assembling um uh all these kind of um texts and sources that i could find um and uh was then commissioned by um penguin i i was working with michael neve on a anthology for um, penguin 20th century classics uh about uh fan de siècle uh writing and uh science and culture and they commissioned me to uh produce an anthology of um drug writings and that was really i guess when i started to systematize this sort of hoard that i now had of uh kind of uh you know drug experiences and drug testimonies and subjective accounts and um yeah that uh, anthology came out in 1999 um it was called artificial paradises and that was i guess the sort of source book from which i all this started off in fact it has a section in it about self experimentation you know which quotes accounts from uh you know uh, humphrey davy and jacques joseph moreau and uh, william james and a, and a lot of the people that i write about in this book and from that point on um, I've written quite widely across the history of science and medicine, I've written quite a lot about history of madness and psychiatry, for example. But uh, being a freelance writer, it's um, there's a kind of feedback loop. If you write about something, then people spot you and ask you to write about write some more about that. And then you <laughs> gradually become the go to person. And that happened to me with the history of drugs um, and uh so, yeah, so I guess about 10 years ago, the Welcome Collection uh, did a big exhibition called High Society about the history and culture of drugs. And I curated that and wrote the accompanying book. And from then on, it's been uh, something that, you know, it tends to kind of, um, you know, a topic that comes to me uh, rather than one that I have to seek out. But I'm always happy to do more about it, because if you're a freelancer and a generalist and an independent scholar like I am it's a just a great excuse to jump across boundaries and to cherry pick all the most interesting bits of everything from neuroscience to art and to anthropology you know so whatever so uh, I keep finding great new stories and new angles and uh, that's why I'm still here I guess. Well, wonderful. Well, I, well, could you speed up a bit and um, bring us bring us up to to the present day in Psychonauts and how you came mm -hmm. to write this latest book? Right. I, well, this is um, one of the things that had fascinated me from the beginning when I started um, looking into this was uh, the history of um, self experimentation. Uh, which is not that much written about. Um, and also, you know, most of what's written about it is the story of kind of uh, gonzo scientists, uh, you know, putting it, uh, passing electric shocks and currents through themselves or um, severing their cutaneous nerves to measure how quickly they grew back and all that kind of um all that kind of stuff and you can see why that stopped in science because there are other ways of doing these things um but what's interesting i think about self-experimentation with with drugs with mind-altering drugs is that uh, you're generating this subjective testimony that can't really be got in any other way and uh so it's a fascinating way of following the history of science it goes you know i mean right back to the the royal society you know to the beginnings of modern science and its emphasis on experiment and those questions about uh, how you can prove, um, you know, or demonstrate things like sh thoughts and perceptions and states of mind experimentally. So that was something that I'd always wanted to um, to explore more fully. And that's really the core of this book. And what is a psychonaut? Psychonaut is a word that was coined uh in a novel uh, in the 1940s by uh, a German author Ernst Junger, and uh, psychonaut in his in his novel is somebody who uh, a type of scientist who goes around collecting these. Um, drug-induced experiences, as Junger says, like a butterfly uh, collector with a net going around to capture these, these states of consciousness. And 
it's a very useful word. It didn't exist at the time. You know, the period I'm talking about, particularly like the late 19th century, um, these people were described as self-experimenters. But, you know, as I mentioned, people were self-experimenting in all kinds of ways. And, uh, you know, drugs were actually, you know, experimenting with drugs is probably one of the sort of safest and uh, least reckless types of self-experiment you could do compared to what else was going on there. Then the term... Um, Psychonaut got picked up in the, by the drugs counterculture uh, because Ernst Junger was a great hero to uh, Albert Hoffman, uh, who discovered LSD. So he publicized it. And then by the 80s and 90s, you had um, people calling themselves psychonauts. Um, I think really to just because, uh, you know, to avoid the stigmatizing terms like drug user uh, and to try and give a sense that uh, people who felt that their experiments with drugs were not simply recreation or self-indulgence. There was the kind of program here. They were interested in consciousness and they were investigating it. So in this modern usage, psychonaut is quite well known, but it tends to refer to um, renegades and rebels operating outside institutional science because of course if you're a neuroscientist or psychopharmacologist or somebody who's studying the effects of drugs on the mind taking them yourself is definitely not part of the uh, job description you know quite the opposite in fact uh, so psychonauts these days tend to be outsiders and renegades but i wanted to use the word and take it back to the time when um Institutional scientists and establishment figures uh, ex self-experimented with drugs is just as much as and alongside all the rebels and renegades. Well, it's a, a great title and a, a great word to, to be reclaiming. Um, I'm going to ask the kind of general organizational question. So Psychonauts, um, in, in my reading, is a, a really a work of intellectual history, and mm -hmm. it's organized around different psychoactive substances. So there's a, there are three sections, and they deal with cocaine, nitrous oxide, hashish, um, and then um, it's interwoven through these sections are um, portraits of different historical, um, important historical figures who experimented with these substances, people like Will Sigmund Freud, William James, w William James, W.B. Um, Yeats. Can you give an, us an outline of the book's organization and tell us a little bit about um, sort of its organizational logic, why you organized it this way? Right. Well, there's always, um, you know, this struggle between um, chronological and thematic structures, both of which are very appealing. I basically write narrative history, so I need chronology. Uh, I need um, stories about what happened and then what happened as a consequence of that and so on. Uh, but I didn't want to do a purely chronological history, so with chapters, as it were, on the 1870s, the 1880s, the 1890s, because there was so much going on in those decades, you'd be zipping backwards and forwards. So as you say, I kind of picked three themes for the first three parts of the book, and I didn't actually centre them round uh, individual drugs specifically. What I was looking for were things that are kind of currently in our sort of 21st century zeitgeist in this sort of psychedelic renaissance and with our interest in cognitive enhancers. And um, so I've kind of picked three um, themes of um, interest and three types of research. And yeah, the first one is really about um, cognitive enhancers and brain boosters and the idea that there might be drugs that uh, increase our energy and our capacity and our intelligence and that is um, mostly they're not entirely about cocaine and I've framed that by starting with Sigmund Freud's uh, cocaine experiments and writings. The second one is about uh, drugs and the limits of consciousness, what happens in sort of, uh, you know, with disembodied consciousness and out of body experiences and these drugs that kind of, um, you know, separate the mind from the body and leave the mind kind of, uh, you know, navigating uh, this infinite space. And this is the kind of question that people tend to ask today using drugs like ketamine and DMT. But in the 19th century, this was explored very thoroughly with um, uh, drugs that had been really come up uh, 
uh, as anesthetics, uh, nitrous oxide and um, ether and um, chloroform, and much the same conversations as now. Where do we go when our mind goes somewhere and leaves our body? Is that, you know, is this some other part of the mind that we don't normally have access to? Is it a subliminal mind or is it a sort of spirit realm or an astral plane? You know, all these, uh, all these questions that uh, are familiar now were being asked at that time. And then the third theme that I picked was uh, drugs and the creative imagination, which is mostly about hashish, but partly about peyote, which appears at the end. And this is kind of territory that's explored a lot with psychedelics these days, the idea of how you can um, alter your um, internal reality and find ways of uh, spending time in a uh, Air, sort of dimensions of the imagination that you can't normally inhabit and how you can turn this to artistic or literary or occult purposes. So these three stories all kind of have parallel chronologies. They all start at different times and places, but they all kind of culminate in the last years of the 19th century. So then what the fourth section does, what the fourth part of the book does is to really join the dots from there to the present and that does that in two chapters the first of which looks at those years around 1900 which are the years of drug control and drug prohibition uh, and also years in which uh, um, science becomes less interested in introspection and in subjective experience more interested in behaviorism and data and then the second part of that jumps forward 50 years and looks at those years in the uh, mid 20th century, the 1950s and 1960s that uh, we now think of as the psychedelic era, because that's when the word psychedelic was coined. And that um, where the word drugs is kind of pejorative and has all these negative associations around it. Um, psychedelics comes along, you know, at a moment when people are getting more interested in inner experience and mystical experience, and people are finding that some drugs produce fascinating experiences of this kind, but you can't really call them drugs because, uh, you know, that uh, brings so much stigma with it. So the word psychedelics is very helpful in opening up this new idea that drug experiences might be positive they might be something that um, helps us to self-transcend or self-actualize or have valuable positive and uh, mystical experiences. So these stories, um, as you mentioned, I'll, I'll sort of start in this period in the late um, 1800s and you kind of give this period a name, you call it before drugs. And um, I think what you mean by that is kind of before progressive drug policies really hardened and various psychoactive substances really became kind of vilified and, and criminalized. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what it was like to consume psychoactive substances in this period. Um, so for the historical actors that you're writing about, what um, what was the context in which their drug mm -hmm. consumption was taking place? Right. I mean, that's... I. I've called it before drugs because that is in quite a literal sense, the word drugs in the sense that we're using it now to mean kind of, um, you know, mind altering uh, substances um, is um, doesn't really appear until 1900. So before that, you know, drugs, the concept of the category that we have now didn't really exist. Uh, there were various um, different um drugs that you might describe as intoxicants. Um, some of them were kind of research chemicals. Some of them were things that were used in medicine, like um, uh, anesthetics. Others were things that you could buy in a pharmacy. And of course, during this period, you could go to a pharmacy and buy cannabis and cocaine and heroin and morphine and all these things. Um, so then uh, in terms of the scientists who are who, who are using these drugs they are um i think there's a there's definitely a distinction um between scientific use and what we would now call recreational use or use out of curiosity um but it's very porous uh this distinction um it's interesting to look at the writing, um, which is really kind of the centerpiece of this book, is the sort of subjective accounts of drug experiences, because you realise that what an enormous number of write of um, artists and well of of um, 
scientists and doctors during this period were also writers. You know, they wrote poetry or they wrote novels. And um, in the days before the tick box diagnosis, being able to describe a medical condition was, you know, a very important skill. Uh, and a lot of um, doctors were extraordinarily good at it. And uh, people who specialized in um, diseases of the mind, you know, were particularly skilled at it. So um, these descriptions by scientists bleed out into the wider culture. They're often written in literary terms. Trying to describe an altered state of consciousness is a literary form as much as a scientific form. Quite often they're published in popular magazines of the day. They're very popular with the writing public. Um, particularly towards the end of the 19th century, when what we now call drugs start to be conceived as more of a social problem it becomes very important for scientists to make it clear that you know their scientific research is not of the same caliber as somebody randomly buying a you know hashish or cocaine in a pharmacy and taking a huge dose of it although there are plenty of people doing that and getting interesting results so you kind of have this idea that emerges within science of the trained observer uh, who's, of course, almost always a white male because science is constituted of white males at uh, at that point. Uh, and they're almost all of the sort of professional classes. Uh, the historian of science, Simon Schaffer, has a very nice uh, phrase for this. He calls it the Cartesianism of the genteel. So uh, if you're of a certain class of person, you know, you're able to separate your mind from your body, you can separate your intellect from your passions, and you can describe the sensations and perceptions that you're feeling reliably. And uh, so that's, um, so that's the context in which um, doctors and scientists are experimenting. This is not something that's taboo or stigmatized. It's something that uh, can be made to appear um, reckless or dangerous. Um, but it's also, for, for many scientists, it is kind of a mark of seriousness. If you look at someone like Humphrey Davy, who's kind of right at the beginning of this story with his experiments on nitrous oxide in 1799, um, that was really what launched him, you know, to become the great scientific hero of his generation and the president of the Royal Society was that he'd shown this dedication to science by, you know, taking enormous amounts of nitrous oxide and uh, describing his experiences. So there's a there's a kind of heroic quality to it as well as a sort of potentially disreputable one. Oh, one of the things that drew me to this book was the cover, which has got this wonderful picture of William James on it. And I'm a huge William James fan. And um, William James... James and then um, also Sigmund Freud are really um, protagonists in in the story you tell. There um, they feature very prominently, and they're um, two figures that are um, uh, sort of endlessly fascinating for researchers across a variety mm. of fields um, too. Um, so, uh, but but you part of your argument is that their experimentation with um, psychoactive drugs has been really wrongly dismissed, or I guess, in the, you know, to use Freud's language, repressed almost mm -hmm. by, by previous biographers. Um, and I wondered if you could tell me a little bit um, more about the relationship between their self-experimentation and their really groundbreaking theories of mind that we're still talking about today. Sure. Well, they're, um, I mean, I picked them. I picked uh, Freud and James partly because they are really the two towering figures of that kind of generation of the discovery of the unconscious and the uh, you know uh, emergence of the modern mind, and also because they both self-experimented with mind-altering drugs in very different ways. And um, uh, but I don't. I mean, I, they're great motors for my story, but. Um, they what the other thing I really want to do is to show that they weren't kind of doing this in a vacuum, you know, that all kinds of people, uh, their contemporaries and their colleagues and people working in different fields were self-experimenting with 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 drugs. So I kind of rather than heroes, they're kind of exemplars. But I think both their stories are interesting. As you say, they've both been minimized um by uh 
subsequent historians and biographers and in Freud's case by Freud himself because his papers on cocaine he made sure were never reprinted they're not included in his collective works and so on and uh, Ernest Jones his first biographer um, minimized his work on it as a called it a kind of juvenile aberration and um, nobody really since then has ever had a good word to say about Freud's cocaine experiments because uh, it's sort of Freudians and um, psychoanalysts and Freud's biographers have all kind of, um, you know, uh, said as little about it as possible. And the anti-Freudians have always jumped on us and gone, look, you see, he was a cocaine addict. Uh, I don't think either of these takes are particularly um, smart. And I think there's an awful lot in Freud's work that's interesting. Um, his first paper on cocaine, Uber Coca, I've kind of done a bit of a close reading of that, but just in terms of its literary style, because I think it tells us a lot about Freud and where he was coming from. It's very beautifully written. It's written in a style, a uh, very lit literary style in, in some parts that he doesn't really use again. And it um, hops in very interesting ways between the first person and the second person and the third person. So the third person writing about cocaine, that's very much the tradition that Freud was being trained in by Ernst Brucker, who was his great mentor, who was a disciple of von Helmholtz, um, had a very materialist view of mind, and this was all about generating objective data. But Freud, of course, was also... Um, and very much enthralled to the generation of romantic scientists of people like um, Goethe and von Humboldt. And um, in his reading around on cocaine, um, he read some wonderful first person descriptions by the Italian neurologist um, Paolo Mantegazza, for example. And he clearly wanted to write himself into the story in that way. So um, I think he achieves a very interesting um, fusion of different perspectives and um, he unites two kind of strands of self-experimentation which are both well developed at uh, at that point um, and I think he does the same in more practical terms in his um, second paper on cocaine where he um, uh, it's the only time Freud uh, ever did you know, experiments on humans, including himself. And um, he gets hold of a dynamometer, which is something that, uh, you know, measures the force that you're exerting on it. And, uh, uh, you know, another device that measures his reaction times. And um, he wants to test this um, subjective perception about cocaine, that it makes you more powerful and more energetic. And so he uses the dynamometer to demonstrate that, yes, indeed, um, you know, people, including him, who've had a dose of cocaine, you know, do have uh, more power and energy at their disposal. Uh, but then he goes on uh, to make a very interesting leap, which um, prefigures uh, his later work, um, which is uh, to consider whether the, the euphoria produced by cocaine, the sort of positive mood and the um, happiness that it produces. Uh, and he wonders whether that isn't a in fact, a, a primary effect, because he notices that it's when his subjects feel this euphoria, um, that's the point at which they start to uh, exert more force on the dynamometer. But at that point, most of the cocaine hasn't yet dissolved into their bloodstream. So this sets him on the trail of the idea that this might actually be a, a, a state of mind, a change of a state of mind that uh, unlocks this um, physiological response and uh, gives the organism access to energy which it doesn't have otherwise. So this idea that a mental effect might have a physiological response, you know, is clearly something that, uh, you know, I mean, that's when, when the Freud that we know picks up a few years later, that's kind of where he comes in. So can you um, tell us a little bit of what, what about William James? Why, why is uh, he such a kind of a key figure in, in, in Psychonauts? I think he's, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's a fascinating figure. And I think his experiment with nitrous oxide is a, wonderful way into his thinking because unlike Freud he sticks with it I mean he first of all in it's in the 1870s he first comes across this pamphlet about nitrous oxide and this mystical experience written by Benjamin Blood and he writes a kind of slightly quizzical review of it and then it's, but it obviously stays with him. And then several years later in 1882, he decides to 
uh, inhales some nitrous oxide himself while he's working on, um, you know, trying to figure out what his position on Hegel is. Uh, and he has a wonderful mystical experience, which really sends him um, down, uh, you know, a very uh, fertile and productive route. A lot of his... Um, work in the 1880s and 1890s on the mystical experience and the stream of consciousness. You can see the presence of that nitrous oxide experience. And then 20 years later, in varieties of religious experience, he puts his uh, experience with nitrous oxide right at the center of that. And, um, you know, it says that, uh, you know, this shows us that our normal waking consciousness is only one form of consciousness. And there are all kinds of other forms of consciousness in which the world and reality looks quite different. And uh, you can't say that they're wrong, you know, their experience, they're just as valid as any other form of experience. And, you know, this feeds into his later sort of developments his um in his um uh you know his his radical empiricism and uh his uh view of the um reality as a multiverse in which all these different perspectives need to be contained and the very last piece of writing that he publishes in his lifetime is a tribute to um benjamin blood the person who turned him on to nitrous oxide in the first place well anyway just, the book is also just uh fascinating for uh, folks who might be interested in freud um and james and um i i was was glad that i saw the cover and decided to pick it up um <laughs> The, in, in the book, you talk about psychedelic drug research in the early 1960s, and you term it um, the return of the psychonauts. And this is, uh, you already talked a little bit about how um, this um, kind of psychedelic renaissance inspired, you know, your, your framework and your readings of the older text. Um, I wondered if you, you could talk just a little bit more about how the psychoactive revolution of the 1960s um, fits into this um, this story of the psychonauts. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we talk now about the psychedelic renaissance, you know, where we are to describe where we are now, which is a renaissance of what, you know, the 1950s <laughs> and the, you know, 1960s when uh, the word psychedelic was, uh, um, was, was coined. Um, but from the sort of position that I'm coming from here, then that original psychedelic um, era seems itself to be a renaissance. It's a recovery of a program um, that had been running very effectively of um, uh, people uh, you know, using drugs to expand consciousness and to explore and address all the questions that raises, you know, which had been um, in ways that I think we've forgotten, you know, that was, uh, you know, quite, you know, a very powerful and uh, influential strand in 19th century uh, science and ideas, uh, interrupted in the early 20th century by the progressive era and um, drug control and drug prohibition. Uh, so I think you can see the, um, you know, the, the interest in psychedelics that appears in the 1950s and the 1960s uh, as, um, a, as a revival of this um, 19th century period. And indeed, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the great touchstones for it, like William James, you know, enormously influential on Abraham Maslow and the concept of the peak experience and self-actualization and all these positive um, psychological languages in which the psychedelic experience was, was framed. Well, I think the other thing um, that happened, uh, I mean, people talking about this, um, you know, this period, you know, you then tend to go into the um, psychedelic um, drug counterculture of the uh, 1960s, and uh, that becomes the main story. I haven't really written about that very much because it's been so well covered and there are still plenty of people around who remember it and are writing about it firsthand. But I do think the story from that period that has been forgotten, you know, in terms of uh, what we might call psychonautics, is um, the 1962 um, federal FDA amendments, which introduced um, the, the Kafava Harris amendments, they're called, which introduced um, randomised controls um, trials and placebo testing and the exclusion of extra pharmacological variables and all these strictures that now govern, um, you know, uh, drug research and drug licensing. And I think that was really the end of um, 
the psychonauts because uh, that was the point at which, um, you know, subjective experiences of a drug became irrelevant, you know, at least in medical terms, if you're, you know, if you're trying to make this drug into a medicine, uh, because a safe and effective medicine was defined as uh, one that had been tested against the largest possible cohort of um, subjects and uh, had demonstrated a really good, solid, uh, you know, repeatable effect, you know, with lots of um, biomarkers so you could establish what effect it was having at this dose and that dose. And psychedelics just aren't like that. They don't behave like that. You know, people have very different responses to them. Uh, the extra pharmacological variables, which we now call set and setting, have an, you know, an enormously powerful effect on the experience. So I think that was the point at which um, self-experimentation disappeared, you know, from uh, institutional science and medicine. Uh, and that was also the point at which people started uh, experimenting informally. And the, the really interesting figure, I think, there is uh, Alexander Shulgin, the chemist who uh, um, uh, synthesized um, dozens, hundreds of uh, psych uh, psychedelic and psychoactive compounds, MDMA and 2CB and so on. Uh, he was working independently. He wasn't trying to patent his drugs or get them licensed by the FDA. So he could do um, what he wanted. So he self-experimented with them. He was a very principled self-experimenter. He said, if you're a chemist and you're making drugs, you have to take them to understand what they're doing. And he had a little informal circle of people who self-experimented with him. Uh, so he's the kind of the model for that um, sort of type of independent underground chemist who then in subsequent decades started to refer to themselves as psychonauts. And what I think is interesting about um, Alexander Shulgin's writing is it takes us way back to the beginning of this story, to H Humphrey Davy, you know, when he first um, experimented with nitrous oxide, his report had a first section which was about the chemical synthesis of nitrous oxide, and then a section about experiments on animals and on humans and physiological measurements, and then finished with these accounts by all his friends who included romantic poets, you know, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge and Robert Southey describing the effect, um, which is obviously, you know, how do you square that with a chemical synthesis? You can't. They're completely different languages. They're not compatible, but you kind of need both. And so if you look at uh, Alexander Shulgin's big door-stopping uh, volumes of his chemical syntheses, he does exactly the same thing. He explains the chemical synthesis and um, then he gives um, subjective commentary on the effects and puts the two together. Well, there's a lot we can learn from this period, and I think that's uh, one of the central kind of uh, arguments or driving force of the book. Um, the conclusion of the book argues that, and this is a quote, a post-drug post -drug world, this is the beginning of the book was before drugs, but a post-drug world would not need a new language, but the recovery of an older one. Um, I, I wonder if you could kind of, um, I've this is our next to last question. So I wonder mm -hmm. if you could kind of wrap up by saying a little more about what you mean by that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's quite a, when I say an older language, it's quite a recent one, because as I mentioned, we didn't have this word drugs as a portmanteau word. Uh, it only really appears in 1900 in the early 20th century. And it's an odd word if you think about it, because it doesn't quite mean psychoactive drugs. It means some psychoactive drugs, but not others. I mean, when we talk about caffeine or alcohol, we don't say drug, um, you know, so um, uh and it's very much loaded with, you know, from the very beginning, it meant it was a shorthand for drugs of addiction or foreign drugs or criminal drugs. You know, it's got all those meanings baked into it. So I think if we if we didn't use that word anymore, what would we say? Well, we'd say things like stimulants and sedatives and psychedelics. We'd be a little bit more, um, you know, uh, kind of specific in our meanings. If we had a term like stimulants, that would include, you know, on the one hand, Adderall and prescription medicines, but also methamphetamine. We can't, wouldn't be able to put those in separate categories anymore, you know. Uh, we'd still obviously talk about controlled drugs and, you know, illicit drugs, and we'd have those terms. So if we didn't use the word drugs, uh, then um, I think we'd have a language that was kind of... Um, less kind of um, 
didn't have that sort of uncomfortable blend of um, science and morality that uh, the language of, of, of drugs and narcotics, which I guess is the sort of medico legal sort of uh, um, version of that term. If we didn't have those, then we'd be a little bit more specific in what we were talking about. And rather than having this small number of mind altering drugs in this illegal silo, we'd be able to patch them in um, and uh, make sense of them in terms of all those other substances out there like nicotine and caffeine and alcohol. And I think if maybe we, if we had a le level playing field of all those, uh, we could probably devise more rational policies based on um, minimizing their harms. Wonderful. Well, um, well, that brings us to our traditional final um, New Books Network question, which is, um, uh what are you working on next what's what is uh what's what's the the next big project that's a very good question uh the short answer is i have um quite a lot of um smaller projects and commissions and assignments following on from this and um uh they may which you know any of which may or may not morph into the next big project but uh, <laughs> at, at, at the moment this is uh, this is kind of all consuming but uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, a new project emerging and I I imagine it'll be something um this feels to me a little like a kind of capstone in my work on mm -hmm. the history of drugs it pulls together a lot of stuff that I've written before so uh, I imagine I'll be launching out into something slightly different next time well, it it well it it was for me. It was an introduction to your work, and it was absolutely wonderful. I am I am hooked. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Great. Oh, uh, thank I, you so much uh, for coming on the show. Oh, real pleasure. <laughs>